Recently, our nation was shocked by the horrific tragedy that occurred in Newtown, Connecticut. In response, there has been a renewed commitment to creating school communities that are safe and ensuring that our students receive all they need to learn and grow. As a member of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, I was proud to join Congresswoman Jackie Spear, Sheriff Greg Monks, the County Office of Education, and the County Office of Behavioral Health and Recovery Services in gathering local leaders and service providers for a summit entitled Beyond Newtown, How to Ensure Safe Schools and Communities. In one room, we brought together school district officials, police chiefs, mayors, city council members, public health and mental health service professionals. And at the end of the conference, three task forces were created to take a close look at San Mateo County's efforts to prevent tragedies in our communities. The three task forces addressed standardization of protocols, mental health services, and information sharing between agencies. What you're about to see is the School Safety Summit's keynote address delivered by Dr. Katherine Newman. Dr. Newman is one of our nation's leading experts on gun violence in schools. Among other things, Dr. Newman discusses the signs to look for in troubled students. Thank you for watching. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I've had an opportunity to talk about this research in many settings, but none more important to me than my hometown, uh, my home county. And I want to thank all of you for being here. I especially want to recognize the leadership of Congresswoman Speer. Uh, I think all of us are asking questions about the effectiveness of re representative government these days with the failure, failures in Congress to take up the seriousness of this legislation. And it's going to require the concerted effort of leaders like Congresswoman Speer to ignite a national movement that's going to have to teach Congress a lesson about what it is that we, the citizens, are looking to them to do. So let me tell you a little bit about this research. It took place in small towns in rural areas of the country, which are actually the place where this kind of tragedy is most likely to happen. And that's a sad fact of life, but it's one that we have to acknowledge if we're going to learn how to prevent these things. So what I want to talk to you about is why terrible things happen in perfect places. Because there is actually a lot to be known here. This is not actually a mystery. There are things we can learn and aspects of prevention we can put into place as a result. So I want to start by a little bit of definitional work, uh, because not all shootings are made alike. And shootings that happen on the streets in big urban areas are not the kind I'm going to be talking about. So I want to be sure that you understand what it is I think I can generalize about, because every different setting has its own cocktail of problems that we need to understand. But a rampage shooting in schools involves multiple victims, it happens on school property, it's committed by someone who has been or is presently part of that community, and the targets are not really targets at all. They are random, they are at best a radiating circle, meaning somebody who might have been in a category like a jock or a teacher and then radiating out to people the shooter doesn't even know he's hit. That's the kind of shooting I'm talking about. OK. Uh, we have had, actually, a surprisingly small number of these shootings, tragic as they are. They are actually quite rare, and it's important for you to remember that, because they achieve an outsized prominence, especially compared to the far more numerous street shootings in large urban cities. But this kind of shooting tends to happen in small towns, and it is actually relatively rare. But I want to draw your attention to that peak that occurred toward the late 1990s and to the red spike that follows it. Because those blue lines, those are actual shootings. And the red lines are attacks that happened or on the way past Columbine that were not completed. This is important. When these shootings happen, they tend to spawn a lot of mimicry. But when they spawn that mimicry, people who know that something like this could happen and hear threats behave differently when they know it could happen. They start coming forward to inform people they trust, and those plots get stopped along the way because the reporting behavior changes. So after one of these shootings, two things happen. More imitative shootings are on the way, and more of them get stopped, leading to fewer actual completed shootings. But they are on the way. Next slide. Now, when these first began happening, there was a view in the world that this represented some kind of southern culture of violence because the first shootings happened in the south. But they quickly spread throughout the country. So there is no 
geography that protects you from these shootings. But that doesn't mean that there's no relevance to geography. I think the thing you will notice most in common across these cities or these places is that you've never heard of them. Or if you've heard of them, it's because they had a shooting. But before the shooting, you've never heard of these places because they're happening for the most part in tiny towns in obscure parts of the country, far away from the big cities that we associate with gun violence. And that's an important fact. Why is this happening in such small towns? That's part of what I want to explain. Next slide. And we did that through looking at two case studies, and I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but I want you to understand some of their texture because it'll help you see why the recommendations we make hold water. There are three questions I want to answer about these two case studies that, that I think are important this morning. What is the shooter trying to accomplish? It is hard for us to think about shooters as having a particular problem they're trying to solve, but we're smarter if we understand that that's actually what's going on. They have a problem they're trying to solve. The shooting becomes the way they solve it. Second, why can't schools see this coming? We uncovered evidence at least nine months in advance of those shootings that had anybody been able to put the picture together would have told us a shooting was on the way. Why are schools unable to see it coming? And third, why was the community in the dark? Because there's an awful lot of evidence piling up that something is wrong here, but there are lots of reasons why communities have a hard time reconciling themselves to that possible pathway and stopping it in its tracks. Okay, next slide. So the first case I'm going to talk to you about took place actually not in Jonesboro, Arkansas, which is a town of 55,000 people. It took place outside of Jonesboro. It was a commute into Jonesboro from the place where this happened. So this is a fairly rural area of the country in Arkansas. Next slide. It's a very religious community, and it has about 55 churches for a population of 55,000, so it is a very religious community. Next slide. Uh, the actual shooting took place in a school district that encompassed three small areas beyond Jonesboro. The biggest of them, Bono, had 1,000 people. Next slide. The next one in size, 280 people, Cash, Arkansas. This is downtown Cash, the only place where you can get anything to eat. That's it. That's the whole social circle of Cash, Arkansas. Next slide. And then Egypt, and this is it for the center of Egypt. So we are talking about places that are incredibly tiny, and that has something to do with what motivated the shooter, with how isolated the shooter felt in a tiny, tiny town so far from urban centers. Next slide. The shooting itself, next slide, <clears throat> took place in a middle school. Sixth and seventh graders, only 250 students, so it is not the case that these shootings are prompted by anonymity, large institutions where nobody knows anybody. This is exactly the opposite. It's prompted in a place where everybody knows everybody. And it's that incredibly tight social linkage that produces these outbursts. It's a middle class community. It's a very Christian community. It's completely white. There's no racial element to this at all. There is no background violence. And there's no protection events violence either, because no one is expecting it to happen since it doesn't happen in places like this a school with an excellent reputation. These shootings are generally not happening in schools that have reputation for being dysfunctional, problematic. On the contrary, people move to that community in order to put their kids in this excellent school. It's a fairly middle class place, but about one third of the students were, were eligible for free lunch. So there is a population that is less affluent. Next slide. March 24th, Mitchell Johnson steals his family car. He's never driven a car before in his life. And he somehow wobbles over to a gas station where in the middle of the school day, this 14-year-old comes out of this car to try and get gas into a car, and no one asks, why is he not in school? Picks up his friend, Andrew Golden. They attempt to find a catch of guns. They take a blowtorch to a safe in Andrew Golden's grandfather's house. They can't get the safe open, but this tells you something about how dedicated they were to getting their hands on guns. They fail to get the safe open, but then find a catch of guns that have been secured, completely secured, with cables. They clip the cables, take the guns, drive wobbly over to the middle school, which is surrounded by a kind of bank of hillsides, 
lodged himself inside the woods behind the school, Andrew Golden, age 11, 11, runs down out of the hillside, pulls the fire alarm, sending the school population into basically a shooting bowl right in the middle. They are positioned over this bowl in front of the gymnasium, and they begin shooting into their targets. Five people are killed, four children and a teacher who died trying to shield one of the children, and they wound 10 others. They go back and hide onto the hillside and are identified immediately by the students in the school. They all know who that is long before law enforcement has any idea and comes to arrest them. So who are these two kids? Mitchell Johnson. This was a picture that his school printed about him uh, less than a year before the shooting. He was honored as one of its lively musicians. I remember sitting with his mother, who I interviewed three years after the shooting, and she showed me a letter she received from one of the guidance counselors in his school two months before the shooting. Mrs. Johnson, you must be so proud of Mitchell. He is the most wonderful boy, so polite. I don't know how you raised such a wonderful child. Thank you very much, Mrs. So-and-so, two months before. His image in the school was one of the most polite kids in terms of the, the way the teacher saw him, polite, orderly, honorable, a good student but he had a very different history that was unknown to his teachers and invisible to his peers. His father, from whom his mother was divorced, was verbally abusive. He had been sexually assaulted as a child. The divorce between his parents was extremely tense. They moved, his mother moved frequently, but actually Jonesboro was the most positive move Mitchell made, and he was regarded as doing very well. As I said, he was a good student. Next slide. Andrew Golden. 11 years old, a sixth grade student from a solid family. His parents were both postal workers. He was the only child in this family. They had waited years to have him and hence was regarded as their treasure, their golden child. Family are avid, gunters, avid hunters and gun enthusiasts, as are many people in that part of the world. They taught him to be a shooter, and one of the photos we print in the book was of Andrew holding his first shotgun at the age of six. He was qualified as a shooter. He was a target shooter and quite good at it by the age of 11. Again, average to good student, no disciplinary history, and this is important to, to remember. These shooters rarely have any kind of disciplinary history, partly because it, what we have gets lost and partly because they're actually not troubled students. They are not the squeaky wheels that everyone's looking for. They are the people flying underneath that radar screen. Next slide. I'm gonna go quickly through, through this. This is the second case I wanna tell you about in Heath, Kentucky. Again, a rural area, farming economy, starting to see more new professionals moving in, but on, on the whole, a very tight-knit community, economically diverse but completely white in the middle of the Bible Belt. Next slide. So you can see, let's go through these slides next few. There are people who live in very affluent houses like this. Next slide. But most people live in houses like this, and a few live in trailers like this. So it is an economically diverse but racially homogeneous part of Kentucky. Next slide. So what happened in this shooting? In Heath High School, the center of small town life, everybody in Heath loves that high school. All the adults come to every football game that's ever played there. Tremendous spirit in that town. 60% of the students are college bound, but they tend to stay in the local area that where they've come from. So they live at home and they go to the local community college or state, state institution. No major discipline issues, no violence prevention in place because violence doesn't happen in Heath High School, except on December 1st, 1997, when Michael Carneal brought a loaded shotgun into the center of the school lobby and gunned down a bunch of people assembled for a daily prayer group. Eight shots, eight victims. He drops the gun and surrenders to the principal. Next slide. So who is this guy? Michael Carneal, 14 years old. This is November of his freshman year in high school. Very stable family. Father is a lawyer, mother is a homemaker. Michael has a reputation at most for being a jokester and a prankster, always trying to get attention, which I'll talk about later is one of the reasons why people discounted what he said about his intentions to shoot people, because Michael was always saying crazy things, trying to get attention. Very high IQ. Minor discipline problems that, again, tended not to follow him in the form of a record. One of the things we learned in this project is that when things pile up, say, in eighth grade, 
and kids move to the high school, the disciplinary records are shredded in between those two schools. And there are lots of reasons why that's the case. We don't want to prejudice next year's teachers with a negative view of this child. Everyone can have a bad year. Everyone has a chance to start over. And there are lots of good reasons why we believe in that second chance model. But there are also consequences. We lose the trail when it moves across institutions. He was later diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder, but at the time, he had never been treated, never been diagnosed, was totally unknown for having any kind of mental health problems. This brings up another important issue, which I'm sure the mental health professionals in the audience will recognize. We know what people with schizotypal personality disorder look like when they're in their 20s. But the early onset of severe mental illness, when someone is 12 or 13, can be very difficult to recognize. And that's part of the problem we're dealing with with these school shooters. They are almost all of them mentally disturbed and often suicidal. But what that behavior looks like when you're 12 or 13 can be very difficult for people to identify. Next slide. This is a picture of Michael Carneal at his arraignment, a very depressed, very depressed 14-year-old. Also note that he is a very slender, eyeglass-wearing little, little guy. Today, Michael Carneal is six feet tall, 250 pounds. And if he had looked like that when he was this age, my guess is this wouldn't have happened. He was on the losing end of those pecking orders that tend in high school to privilege the more mature, physically mature boys who are looked up to because they have the physical stature of the men they're going to become. But there's such variation in what adolescent boys look like at this age. And those who look like Michael tend to be on the losing end of those high school pecking orders that mean so much to them. Next slide. So we have a series of background events. We know that Mitchell had his problems. We know that there was nothing really to see in Andrew's, um, in Andrew's background until later on when we discover that he threatened suicide, but not in ways that adults knew about. Mitchell, there were a series of things that really frightened him, that his father was going to take him away from his mother's house. He was kicked off the basketball team. He was dumped by a girlfriend. So there were events that looked like they might have had a triggering role. Next slide. But I want to give you a different sense of how we might think about those triggers by coming back to my three mysteries. First, what is motivating the shooter? I want you to get your, wrap your heads around the idea that they're trying to solve a problem. And the problem is they're not respected by their peers. They're not incorporated into the peer groups that matter to them. They are on the margins. They are failing at the task of establishing themselves as credible males. They're not good with girls. They're not good with sports. They are actually, and this is the saddest part, I have to say as an educator, fairly good students. And that's not a passport to prestige in their social circles either. To be a boy who's interested in school, sadly, is a liability in many places. So they're, they're failing at this task of establishing themselves as credible men. Their daily experience, their daily social experience, is not one of being isolated. They are not isolates or loners, as the press often describes them. They are people who are failing at joining things. And they are constantly trying to join things. Join peer groups, find a group that will accept them, and their daily experience is that of friction on the margins. They are rejected every time they try until they start talking about shooting people. And when they start talking about shooting people, suddenly everybody's looking at them. Oh, cool. Let's talk about that some more. And for the first time ever, Michael Carneal is starting to get the attention he's been craving for years. Except now he's starting to make promises about what he's going to do to encourage that attention. And the more promises he makes, the more he's bound into this pathway. So even though, right up to the time of the shooting, Michael is incredibly ambivalent about what he's going to do, the idea of backing down is socially inconceivable. One more catastrophic failure in his social circle, and he'd be finished. So he pushes himself right past that ambivalence and shoots his friends. When Michael Carneal was asked in the forensic investigation afterwards, what did you think was going to happen, Michael, after the shooting? He said, I thought they would come over to my house, and I would go over to their house, and I would be friends. I would have friends. That's what Michael Carneal thought was going to happen. 
because he wasn't really thinking about killing people. He was thinking about solving his problem, and his problem was complete social marginality. Because Michael was and is mentally ill, he tried to commit suicide once he was in jail, he was hearing, hearing voices in his head. He was unable to touch the ground in his bedroom because he was afraid of vipers on the, on the floor, the kind of thing my kids thought about when they were two years old or three years old. That was very real to Michael. But did anybody know this? Nobody knew this. No doctor, no parent, no nobody. When you have that kind of faulty interpretive equipment, every slight you encounter is magnified, every single one. I don't know anybody that's passed through high school, <clears throat> including my beloved high school, Mills, that didn't experience slights, rejection, tension in peer groups. It's just the nature of adolescence. It's the reason why most of us actually don't want to go back to high school now. <laughs> But if you have a, a mind that's deteriorating, every one of those slights is magnified into something enormous. It's a catastrophe. It's the end of the world. And every day feels like the end of the world if you're like Michael Carneal. So you have a problem. How are you going to solve this problem? You're trying to reverse this reputation you have for being a dweeb and a loser. And you're going to do that through the one mechanism that has, sadly, a lot of popular culture support. You're going to define yourself as notorious, as dangerous, as alluring, just like those characters like the Joker and Batman, who everybody respects because they're so scary. And that actually is a superior alternative to what you're faced with now, which is Joker, loser, nobody. And you start making these commitments because you can see this is solving your problem. Michael stole a gun from his father, brought it to school, and the goth group he was trying to impress said, Michael, that's not good enough. That pistol, no, we want to see a shotgun and a trench coat. And he went home and he got a shotgun and a trench coat. Because what he wanted was the acceptance of that group. <coughs> Next slide. And this was the leader of the group. <clears throat> now, to our eyes, this sort of somewhat satanic view is sort of almost comical. But you can imagine what someone like this represents in a tiny Bible Belt community. This is the ultimate in rebellion. And this was who Michael desperately wanted to be accepted by. And these were the people who said to him, go home and get a shotgun and a trench coat. Next slide. OK, so there's lots of evidence piling up that something's going to happen when you backtrack through all the peer groups three years later with the advantage of being a social scientist. Why are the schools in the dark about this information? The first reason is that clean slate ideology I talked to you about. And that is actually accepted by all of us, that there should be a clean slate moving from one year to the next so that every kid can improve. But we lose a lot of information when we do things that way. The second is this mixed signals. Michael Carneal, again, known for being uh, one of the best students in the school, Mitchell Johnson. Mitchell Johnson every day opens the doors for the lady teachers, yes ma'am, no sir. When we interviewed those teachers, they told us they could have thought of 50 other kids who would have done something like this before they got to him. Because the signals these shooters send out to the adults in their atmosphere is very positive. And they are often seen as uh, exemplary students. Witness that letter that Mitchell Johnson's mother received two months before the shooting. But when you talk to their peers, nobody is surprised. Everybody in that middle school knew who was hiding up on that hillside. None of the adults had a clue. Why did they know? Because for months before that, these shooters had gone into the school cafeteria and said things like, you'll see who lives or dies on Monday. Or, I'm going to be running from the cops and you won't see me for a while. And the kids are thinking, whoa, what does that mean? But consider the source. The source is someone who has been saying jokester, prankster things, trying to get attention for years. And as a result, they question the source, and they're not sure what exactly they're hearing. So with hindsight, you can interpret this as a pileup of evidence. But at the time, the kids are thinking, Ooh, I'm not sure I know what that means. But not everybody's thinking that way. Lots of people didn't come to school on Monday morning in Heath, Kentucky because they were afraid of what was going to happen. But none of them told any adult, not one. In one case we looked at on the northwest coast in Washington state, the shooter called 16 people, 16 kids the night before the shooting, and told them where to sit. One of them brought a video camera. 
Not a single one told an adult. Why? This is what we have to understand. <clears throat> But the schools don't see it coming, in part because of this Jekyll and Hyde character that not only the shooter has, all kids have this. Right? I know my children didn't behave the same way in front of me as they did in front of their peers. Kids are very good at this movement between peer culture and adult culture. And so, sadly or bizarrely, we are inhabiting parallel worlds in which they don't, com they don't communicate with us in the way they communicate with their peers. There is also a lot of fragmentation of information, and the teachers and guidance counselors in the room will understand what I mean when I say that if you see a kid 50 minutes a day, and that's it, and you observe something that doesn't quite seem right, you don't see that kid again until you've got 50 minutes with them the next day. But the teacher down the line who sees them for a different 50 minutes might be observing something else a little weird, and the, tr the opportunity to combine this information in a way that paints a whole picture can be very hard to find. So Michael Carneal pulled a fish out of a tank in his school and stomped it to death. And he watched pornography on the library computers. And he turned in an essay, which we print in the book so you could judge for yourself what would you do if you got this essay, a truly murderous piece of creative writing using the real names of the kids in his class. Did anybody put these pieces together? No. How could they? There is no professional opportunity in many schools, especially high schools, for teachers to compare notes. And so you get a lot of fragmented information that nobody can put together until you come back three years later when it's way too late. There is also this problem we in social science call loosely coupled systems. Think about an assembly line. An assembly line is a tightly coupled system. If something goes wrong at the beginning of that Ford motor assembly line, you have to stop the line because the car will be a complete mess. But in schools, like other organizations of its kind, every classroom is its own kingdom. If something goes wrong in classroom A, it may have absolutely no consequences for classroom B. You don't stop the assembly line. Unless there is someone who is so disruptive that they're throwing the whole system out of whack. And then we do respond. We have, I mean, I know in San Mateo High, Unified High School District, we had a continuation school. We had schools where kids who were troubled had been identified. But unless you're really troubled and throwing a, a monkey wrench in the entire gears, you just kind of go along. Well, none of these kids were throwing munch, monkey wrenches. They were the best, among the best students in the school. They weren't, they weren't squeaky wheels. That's who gets the attention. Squeaky wheels get the attention. And when you think about what these families were like that these kids came from, Michael Carneal, lawyer's son, homemaker's son, is anybody looking in that direction for a troubled kid? Au contraire, nobody's looking there. Because we think we know where troubled kids come from. And they don't look like this kind of family. So we tend to be blinded by our stereotypes about how trouble is produced, and we're not looking there. Okay, next slide. Why the community didn't see it coming. We like to think about small town America as extraordinarily virtuous. It's the place where everybody knows your name, nobody locks the door, we all know each other. That's why everybody was moving to these towns and putting their kids in these schools, because it was a place where everybody knew your name. That very stability works really well for the 98% of the people who live there who are doing fine. But if you are a marginal kid who isn't getting along well and can't see any likely change over time, that, st that very stability becomes your prison. Your life is never going to change. Remember I said that the, at Heath High School, 60% of the students went on to college. That's a very good record. But they didn't go away. They didn't go anywhere. They stayed very local. These kids are going to the same schools their grandparents went to. So it's the exact opposite of what we see in America generally, which is highly residentially mobile. So if everything's so stable, you say to yourself, I'm having a terrible time, and it's never going to go away. You're also in a place where everybody in all generations knows everyone else. So you can't get away with anything. All right? Your teacher is also your band leader is also your church leader, is also your mother's best friend. And that means that anything you do, you think, is going to be amplified, reputationally amplified throughout that structure, so it makes you feel even more caught. 
But it has another effect. Because everyone thinks we all know each other, nobody realizes there's a whole underground life we don't know at all. That mythology of intergenerational closure makes it difficult for us to recognize that parallel world of peers and teens that's operating in ways we don't know anything about. These wonderful communities where everyone loves the place are also places with a huge crystal meth problem. If you talk to the law enforcement people in the area, they will tell you there's a crystal meth problem. They will point to where it's produced. But it's not the narrative that people tell themselves about this town. Hence, they have a view of their community as completely stable, peaceful, and without problems that's not entirely accurate. <clears throat> These high levels of social capital, the ways in which people interlink with one another, as I said, work very well for the people who are doing well, and that's the vast majority. But for the person who's really going off the rails, like Carneal or Mitchell Johnson, those high levels of social capital feel like a death sentence. Gossip and reputation helps to spin this story in ways that make it very difficult for kids to get away with anything, so they tend to go underground with their deviant behavior, and hence are below the radar. Next slide. <clears throat> I'm almost done. So what really happens in these towns, why terrible things happen in perfect places, is that people play concealment games when there is trouble. We ask the adults in the community, if you saw a kid who was doing something that worried you, would you tell their parents? And their first answer was, absolutely. That's why I live here, because I trust everyone. But 10 minutes later, they say, you know what? I would really be examining their motives. Somebody comes to me with a negative story about my child. Why are they telling me this? Who, do they, who are they trying to besmirch here? And because that's the real experience of people who come forward with negative information, people conceal what they know. Mitchell Johnson was shooting cats in his backyard. Did anyone ever tell his parents that there might be something they should look into? Never. Michael Carneal went to his Lutheran catechism class for a year before the shooting, and when the catechism teacher led the students through an examination of moral dilemmas and how, would, how should we address those moral dilemmas, what would you do, what would you do, his answer was, I'd get a gun and shoot people. Did she ever say anything to his parents? No. Why? Because three generations deep, lawyer, Lutheran family, salt of the earth, I didn't want to embarrass them, she said. All that information piling up <clears throat> never got to the parents. So we have false confidence in surveillance systems. We think we know everything that's going on, and there's a whole world we don't know. And so we misinterpret the signals that we hear, and we actually avoid conflict rather than, and restrict information rather than bringing it out into uh, the hands of those who might be able to help us. Because we're more likely to blame the messenger than we are to share information. Next slide. <clears throat> so. Why does this matter? I'm a sociologist. I think this stuff really matters. It matters because if we think about adolescent problem solving and what that shooter's trying to accomplish, we understand first why they give out warning signals to gain, to gain attention and why they are likely to see this as the, re as the right solution to their problem. Because of the way in which organizational deviance develops in schools, the failure to connect information, because of the liabilities of social capital. So what do we do about all this? I'm going to just talk a, a minute about prevention and then open it up to questions. We will never be able to identify the Mitchell Johnsons and Michael Carneals of this world. They come from good families and troubled families. They are good students and sometimes not great students. They are all over the map. The only thing we can say about them that they have in common is they're boys. Well, so is half the world. Um, and that they are, they're in the early stages of mental illness, which is very difficult to identify. There are millions and millions of American citizens who look just like that. So what can we do? What we can do is make it easier for the kids who hear these threats to come forward to someone they trust. Because that is the very best hope we have for prevention of this kind of gun violence. Kids have this information because the shooter's trying to get attention and is letting out signals about their intentions. Why don't kids come forward with this information? Those kids who didn't go to school on Monday, why didn't they tell someone? Let's just look at it from the adolescent perspective, <clears throat> and you'll see why the solution we've come up with makes sense. 
The signal is noisy. This person's been saying crazy things for years. Now they're saying they're going to shoot people. How do I know that means anything? I don't think people are going to keep it confidential if I tell them, these adults, because I've seen before that when I tell somebody something, it's all over town. How am I going to protect myself if I turned out to be wrong? And nine times out of 10, it will be nothing, because kids say crazy things all the time. The one time out of 10 it turned out to be Michael Carneal, you might wish you came forward, but most of the time it will turn out to be loose talk. If schools adopt zero tolerance policies, and I come forward, my friend who just said some random thing is going to get tossed out of school. I don't want to be responsible for that, so I'm not going anywhere near those teachers or principals to whom that information might mean something. But I will come forward to a school resource officer. I will come forward to someone who looks like they know what they're doing in investigative situations, who will keep it quiet and private if it turns out to be nothing, which most of the time it will be, who knows me, because that's what school resource officers do for a living, they hang out with students, and who will treat this quietly and privately, and I will never be identified as the source, especially if I'm wrong. I will come forward to that kind of person because I know what I'm going to tell them will be handled appropriately, and there'll be some distance between me and whatever happens after that. But I'm not going to come forward to anybody else because the social risks to me of being labeled as a tattletale, a teacher's pet, those are huge in my world. And it's not worth it when you don't really know what the signal means. So this is, I hope this lecture gives you a chance to understand why we would come to a conclusion like this why we think that's the very best way to prevent these particular kinds of gun violence. And on that note, I'm going to conclude and just ask you if you have any questions that I can answer. Thank you. Uh, there are microphones all over. Here's what I'm going to do, people. I'm going to take every single question. I'm going to make a note of it. And then I'll go back and answer as many as I can. So where are you? <laughs> Yeah, hi. I'm a middle school teacher. My name is Jordan Scherer. I'm at Abbott Middle School in San Mateo. And I coordinate the bully prevention program there. A big issue with uh, students is being a snitch, which was what you were addressing. Um, we're looking to change the culture and have the term upstander. And we have had kids, really, who have confidentially come to me or asked for my confidentiality and said, I don't want to be a bystander. I want to be an upstander. Don't want my friends to know that I'm saying this. So the culture changed is really what we're looking to promote. And uh, we know that takes time. But I'm just wondering your, you know, your comments on that. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Next question. Um, I just want to say I agree with what you're saying 100%. I think what you're saying about um, confidentiality and coming forth, peer groups are huge. But what I want to say is that I know for a fact what works and what will prevent this, and that is early intervention, early diagnosis. These things don't just happen that day of school. They started 12 years ago. And I feel that until you educate every teacher on how to identify early onset mental illness, which is actually easy to do, this is not hard, guys. You educate the parents, you educate the teachers on early onset diagnosis, and there will be a paper trail, and you will see things, and they can be watched. It is so simple, we need to stop beating our head against a wall, and, and we're handling it here after it happens, because Newtown happened, and that was terrible. That was horrible, but guess what? Nobody's looking, nobody is paying attention to getting it early, and I'm saying, we can do that. NAMI has a program. There's programs out there. We can change the way we're thinking. Okay, Don't do let's it get after, do it before. Thank you. Another question. Mattis Scott, uh, Healing for Our Families and Our Nation. Um, I lost a son to gun violence in 1996. Uh, he was shot and killed by a friend who was intoxicated but also had some mental illness going on in his family. Um, his mother suffers from it too. Um, we didn't see it 
I mean, we knew about it and we saw it, but I had no idea he would ever be shot by one of his friends. Um, what are some of the interventions that you're doing in the school district um, with the parents? What are some of the problem solving techniques that you're utilizing? Are you little, we, in our uh, school district, we're parents who've lost our children. We're going to the schools, we're going inside the schools and showing these kids who, what happened to our children, showing them their lives and showing them who shot them. At the same time, we share with them pictures of us standing over our children's coffin, the morgue pictures, we, we show them some of those, as graphic as they are, and let them know that this is not a good place for your mom to be in. So we use those techniques and they're working. They're working in the uh, criminal justice system in Juvenile Hall, they're working in San Quentin Prison where we've gone in with no more tears. Um, us telling our stories and the pain that we've experienced to these children, even some of the gang members are now getting out of gangs because they don't want this to happen to their mom. So what are some of the things that you are doing, some of the solutions that you're doing to combat the problem in the schools? Because it is a snitch culture and it doesn't just come from neighborhoods mm -hmm. like that. It's everywhere. <laughs> Nobody wants to tell. But I'm encouraging parents to just, and teachers, to look more closely at these children, to engage with them. Kids today feel ignored. They feel ignored. Even the guys that's in our neighborhood who pants are hanging down below their butt, they're, they're in need of a father, they're in need of somebody. So we're paying attention to them, we're speaking to them, we're, we're talking to them. So our kids, we have ignored them, we've allowed the internet, communications and everything, technology to be their parents and they don't need that, they need us. And we gotta, we gotta change that. Thank so you. what are you doing? Uh, hi, my name is Carl. Um, in listening to everything you said, I came away with the impression that a lot of the pressures on children come from peer pressure, the need to fit in, intergenerational understanding gaps, and a sense of a lack of confidence of their place in society. But I didn't hear anywhere uh, your thoughts about um, any of these children uh, being mentally ill. And the question I'm asking is, do we jump to a conclusion and say that a lot of these children who are placed in this situation are quote unquote mentally ill? I, I can't hear you, are what? Are mentally ill mm -hmm. because of the uh, horror of the action. Okay, That's my question. You. And you, there's what, next to you. Yes, you. Thank you. Um, I, for me, a key word that you were talking about is connectedness. Connectedness to the people at school, connectedness to their families. I think that um, in, in thinking about who they can go talk to, who they can go reach out to, um, it's lucky that some schools might have resource officers. Not many do anymore. So I think in terms of working within the school climate, that it's really important for us to think about making those connections within the school. Um, and also educating, you know, we, we need to let them know who they can go to. So ha making the students have resources um, that they can go to. I work in school health and I'm also a parent. And in listening to this wonderful, very informative presentation, I can't help but think, if this was done, even just at my child's school, the room would be packed. You'd have to have separate sessions. I mean, everybody would go. And, and you, I've heard other people say, how, how are we getting this word out to parents? I happen to have a child who gives me a play-by-play -play of the day, and there are times she tells me things that I do go tell other parents that, that I'm hearing. And how do we work with parents in a way that's not condescending and not telling them how to parent just to help them communicate with their children. I have parents say to me, oh, your daughter tells you everything. My kids don't tell me anything. How, how do we get that word out to them in an appropriate way? Hi, I'm Robert Ross. I'm a retired policeman. You made reference to uh, providing a resource at the schools that uh, kids could go to, investigative bodies and such, and that sounds like our school resource officers. Is there any statistical data or incidents that you're able to point to where uh, children did go to the resource officer and uh, crimes were prevented? Hi, I'm from the uh, 17th District PTA. Uh, 
I'm a mother of two boys. My elder son is a genius. But when he was 10 years old, he became famous in his middle school because he was in the counselor's office at least once a week, almost every day. And I think that really was a fortunate thing for him because two years after he left the middle school, the number of counselors in that school was reduced from three to one. There's now one counselor for a 1,000 children. So my concern is how we're going to redress the issues of the current day when we've already cut back so severely from what we used to provide to our children. So I, one of the reasons I do things this way is I think the questions are almost as valuable as the answers. It's important for everyone to be able to ask them. But let me just quickly say, bullying prevention, very important. Trying to attend to the whole school climate Absolutely crucial, and there is a lot of evidence both from Europe and the US that this makes a difference. People do need to understand their consequences to these actions. A lot of the time, these shooters have had their buttons pushed by kids that were in their circles. Michael, we want to see a shotgun and a trench coat. Supposing they hadn't said that. A little bit less button pushing would make a difference in the lives of these kids. Early identification and diagnosis. I completely agree this is important, but I'm going to leave it to the mental health professionals you're going to hear from today about how easy that is, because I actually don't think it is so easy. But I'm not an expert in mental illness. All I know is these were communities that were well-resourced in, <clears throat> in that domain, and they didn't see these kids coming. <clears throat> and why that was the case is something I leave to the specialists to, to deal with. Um, I, where did she go? There she is. Um, I, I'm terribly sorry to hear about your son. Of course, we all grieve when any child is lost. I think it's important for us to understand there are different kinds of gun violence, and actually the kind involving people who know each other, friend to friend, on the street, is far more common. And we should be paying even more attention to that kind of gun violence than what I'm talking about here, which is rare. It's terrible, but it's rare. The far more common and deadly form of gun violence in the United States is taking place generally speaking, in big cities, between people who know each other, with guns that are coming off the illegal gun markets. And I couldn't agree with you more that this is critical for us to understand, because we don't want to see even one more grieving mother. Um, resource, school resource officers who make connections and letting them know who, um, who they can turn to. It is important for kids to know who they can turn to. I completely agree that in the wake of all kinds of budget cuts, many schools will not have this kind of resource to turn to. What I want to impress on you is the importance of there being some adults in the schools who appear to be, and I hate to say this because I'm an educator too, independent of the school bureaucracy. Because what the kids worry about is if they're wrong, they're going to get somebody expelled who didn't mean it. And if they come to a school person, a, a counselor, whatever, that that may be the result. So it's that distance that the school resource officer has from the school itself as a hierarchy that is part of what makes it feel more comfortable for students to come forward. There may well be other ways. Um, you know, I know that when I was in high school, I was something of a rebellious kid. Frank Seabody, my counselor, will remember that. He's here today. Um, and there were teachers in Mills High School who were kind of the oddballs themselves, right? The film teacher. These were the people that I gravitated to. I love that guy. I'm still in touch with him today. Um, it helps to have a, a few of those round pegs in square holes available in the community. I will say that that's very difficult to do in these tiny towns where these shootings have been happen. There, there may be more opportunity for that uh, in the schools here today. So let me just conclude by saying, yes, there is statistical data that shows school resource officers matter. Um, I don't know that that's been persuasive to the people who hold the, the funding reins, but um, it should be, because it matters. But here's the trouble, people. Because these incidents are so rare, there are many communities, most, the vast majority, that have never been touched by this particular kind of violence. So if you ask them, would you like to devote what are X thousands of dollars to a prevention process in, for something that hasn't happened here and probably never will, it's a difficult choice for them to make compared to some problem they're feeling is constant and must be dealt with immediately. But if you go to any one of the places that I've been in order to write this book, Rampage, they would spare no expense, none, to do whatever they could to prevent something like this from happening. And we all hope 
that that will never be the case, that will never happen in this community, but we know that there have been near misses in the schools in this school district, and hence I don't think anybody can really rest on their laurels. And on that note, I leave you to the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.